Please open your Bibles to Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. While you're opening, let me just mention some upcoming some upcoming uh, sermon series that you will want to make sure that you do not miss. We are going to begin a series uh, on biblical separation, the positive aspects of biblical separation. And we'll actually begin, or I just have dropped everything out of my wallet, sorry about that. We'll actually begin that uh, not next week, but the following week. So in two weeks, a series on biblical separation, and it'll be the positive perspective of biblical separation, one of the most positive doctrines in all the Scripture. And oftentimes it's taught from a negative perspective. And one of the things that uh, I've realized is that everyone has preconceived notions or predetermined, a predetermined position on the matter of biblical separation. First of all, they have their own definition of what it is. And it's not a definition derived necessarily in every instance from what the Bible teaches about it. But everyone has a preconceived notion. They're either for it or they're against it. And God actually has an opinion about what we're to believe about everything. So I want to just urge us as a church that we need to really approach what we believe about everything by saying, God, what do you say? And really not be concerned about what anyone else says about, uh, or even about what we think or what we feel about it. We ought to approach things from the perspective of saying, you know what, whatever God says, I agree with. Has it occurred to you that one day we all will stand before God and we will not be explaining ourselves Amen. We won't say, well, the reason that I went this direction, God. I know you said, but here's why. We will not explain anything to God and have Him say, well, okay, now I never thought of that, and in your case. <laughs> That's ridiculous, isn't it? But yet a lot of Christians doctrinally determine what they believe pragmatically. That is, they say, well, here's why you know, the Bible does say this, but here's why I do something different than what God says. And you know what? You may find some people that will get on that bandwagon, but God won't be there. And someday you'll stand before Him, and God will say, here's what I said, and your response will be, I did it or I didn't. That's, it's as simple as that, actually. And by the way, that's a simpler way to live. You cannot keep up with the tides of change. You can't, you can't stay with the culture. The culture changes too rapidly. I'm amazed at how differently uh, people think in just a period of 10 years about things like even doctrine of how a country ought to function. Should a country look out for its own interests? You know, that was actually a debate in the last presidential election whether or not it's right for a country to put its own interest first. There are people that are confused. That wasn't a debate when I was a kid. It seemed like common sense to make sure that you protected yourself and your own interest as a nation, didn't it? But that's a debate today, actually. And uh, there are people on both sides of it. You can't stay with the times. The times change too much. If you're with it today, you won't be with it tomorrow. But what you can do is agree with God who never changes, and live in the eternal timeless economy that God is in, the kingdom of heaven. And if you live in that economy, my friend, you'll be with it today and tomorrow and for eternity. And that's the way to live. That's the way to live. It's amazing, actually, how what was normal 10 or 15 years ago is unacceptable in our society today because people change, society changes. God doesn't. God doesn't. So let's live that way. Have you found Matthew chapter 25? Let's go ahead and look down at verse 1, and we'll begin reading this morning. I wanted to preach the whole chapter, chapter 25, and I, uh, but I uh, can't do it. We, we, there's too much there, and so we'll try to stick with the first story here this morning. Jesus is talking about the suddenness of judgment. 
verse 1, the Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went and took, went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Is there a song about this? Five were wise, five were foolish? Isn't there? I think there is. I wish I knew it. Joel, do you know the song? You're a wise man, not to admit to knowing it. <laughs> I was going to have you teach it to us. So, good answer. Yeah, I would have if you knew it. Yeah, that's happened before, if you if you remember. Sometimes people get taught, to, like Luke admitted to knowing the Zacchaeus song this morning, and he got to teach it to us before church. So, wise man, five are wise, five are foolish. Verse 3, then they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish son of the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Notice Lord is in caps there. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Father, please help us as we apply the Scripture today to understand the value in watching. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll look back in chapter 24 to verse 36, uh, we see a description actually of the, the events that uh, begin the tribulation. And in or at that, that uh, and, and so in verse 36, the Bible says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so he talks about the day of judgment, and then he talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus. He says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And you see the description, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now let's stop here and we'll just comment just a little bit about the doctrine of eminence. If you've been with us on uh, Wednesday evenings the last couple of weeks, it's actually one of the transcendent truths that we've been teaching and preaching about. And it's possible that that's up on the internet if you have not <laughs> been here for those services. But it's a good idea to be here during all of the messages because we preach three times a week. We have preaching services and you miss a lot if you only come once. So it's a little plug for that. But... Here we see a description of something in the illustration, or I should say the description illustrated by Noah and the flood. Now let me ask you a question. Before the worldwide flood, had there been a precedent for that? Had it ever happened before? No. Were there any signals that a flood was coming? Noah was building an ark and warning people. Okay, so had there been anything like it? You know, it's interesting, the difference in perspective on it, because even in the room today, people are like, no, there was no, there was no warning at all. I mean, there had never been a flood before. Well, it's true. No one had seen anything like it at all. So that is true. There had never been a flood before. And there will never be another one. There will be a fire. There will be a fire, and it's going to destroy the earth. I mean, the earth is going to be consumed in its entirety one day. And that's coming. It's never happened before. So if your faith in its coming, or your preparation for its coming, is determined by the science, this whole weather thing, does anybody here follow the <coughs> climate change? I like, the, I like the phrase climate change. I believe in climate change, don't you? To some, I mean, I think that you know, weather's different every day, you know. And uh, there are cycles in climate change. Actually, there are 20-year cycles, 100-year cycles.
But we don't have enough data to really know about climate change today, do we? Like there isn't enough good data, empirical evidence. We don't have like a thousand years to be able to look at to determine whether or not we have a steady trend. We have a, some of this for over a hundred years, but it's all a guess. And then when we think we know the direction the weather's trending, then the scientists who are predicting the climate change oftentimes find out, oh, we're just completely wrong about that. Back in 1982, there was a big snowfall. Uh, just most of the Midwest and the North and the Northeast and even the South just got hammered by snow uh, in 1982. And I remember it in particular because it was eight miles to our farm from, any, from the next closest place or the, the closest town to our house and we were snowed in for two weeks and uh, back I would have been four years old at the time and we were snowed in for two weeks in 1982 and there were some events that happened within those two weeks that were fairly significant one my dad wasn't home when the snow fell and he couldn't get out there so my dad wasn't home as my mom and us three kids on the farm and dad was in town and so we I think for most of the time we had a phone line we could call but there was, you know, it was too far to walk to be able to get in. I do think my dad ended up uh, taking a four-wheel drive truck and driving as far as he could and then walking uh, through the snow. But that's kind of dangerous because when you have two feet of snow, you have drifts that can be 10 feet and so forth. So you can get lost. I mean, you walk into a 10-foot drift and something collapses on you. It's actually dangerous weather. And this was in Kansas. It made an impression on me as a kid. And, but I remember, you know, you get kind of cabin fever being in the house and there were some things that were happening. One, the deer were, uh, were coming together in herds. We have old eight millimeter films of hundreds of deer, hundreds of deer out in the fields just standing and they're trying to stamp through the snow and get something to eat. So the river's frozen over, they can't drink. And uh, they're, they're all together out in the fields just flocking together. And then the thing that made the biggest impression on me that year, that made me remember 1982, uh, I was only four years old, but made me really remember, were the coyotes. They got together as well. And uh, they were, you know, coyotes, if you're, if you're uh, a lot of people, uh, the, the city kids here don't even know about coyotes. They, all you know is what the uh, earth huggers tell you about them. They're just, you know, you know, they leave them alone, let them live in the city, let them kill your dogs and cats, and that sort of thing. They're, they're beautiful animals. So they're actually, they're mangy. Uh, destructive animals, uh, nasty critters. But um, you know that they come out at night and they howl. Woo! 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 You get a whole uh, a whole pack of coyotes out at nighttime, and they're kind of you know they're kind of scary sounding. They were packing up in the daytime, and they were howling in the daytime. We heard them down in the timber. Oh, I don't know, probably about a half a mile from our house. You could actually hear them running through the leaves, and they are probably chasing deer or whatever, but they were in packs. Well, they were howling in the daytime, and we howled back. You know, the dogs, you know, our dogs would howl back at them at night, warning them to stay away from the farm and so forth. And they howled back and started coming toward us. And I remember my mom grabbing, you know, my sister would have been uh, five or six, and I was four and three. I remember grabbing all three of us and running up to the house and going into the house as they came towards us. That was pretty frightening for a kid to have a pack of coyotes actually chasing. That's how bad the snow was that winter. It was a it was a pretty impressive winter. A little house on the prairie right there. 2.0. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this last winter was actually pretty similar. Uh, this this last winter um, and in the 1990s there was a similar winter about 20 years later. And so about every 20 years there's just a winter where the snowfall just really comes down. It's not quite 20 years, but in a, it's about a 20 year cycle that there's just different weather patterns. And this past winter that we had, remember just up north, yeah. it was like spring's coming now and then whoa, <laughs> they get another snowfall. And the spring's coming and whoa, another snowfall. And so that just happens. Uh, there's a cycles and there's a precedent for that. So a person, meteorologist, and individuals who predict weather actually look at those weather cycles and they can make some pretty good predictions. I, I used to always, I'm still amazed, reading farmers' almanacs that recommend to farmers when to plant and when the rain's going. I'm just amazed, you know, back hundreds of years ago, how farmers knew what the weather would be like. I mean, they just, just the knowledge that they had. I think that today, guys that go to college for meteorology can learn a lot from those guys 
about weather. And they just, they had amazing information, amazing knowledge. And uh, that was, would have been so in Jesus' times. Jesus talks about individuals who say if there's a red sky, you know, red sky at night, sailors delight. And if the weather's this way, this is what you have your sayings. Well, there are also signs of the times. And that's what Jesus uh, was saying. And he said, the signs of the times of my coming are going to be like the signs that the people had in the days of Noah. Now, what were the indications for flood in Noah's day? I asked the question. The answer was there weren't any. Except for what? The warning. The warning. Except for the warning. Noah's building an ark for more than 100 years. He spends all his time building an ark. And says, there's going to be a great flood. What, was the, what were the people's response to Noah's warning? They mocked, him. They, mocked him. they mocked him. They made fun of it. And they didn't listen to him. When the water started to rise, you know, y'all ever watch the Noah's Ark videos? That's all fanciful. It's not in the Bible. Things that, you know, oh, let us in. Noah says, no, there's not enough room. You can't get in. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, when the water started to rise, things got real, didn't they? And they could have said, we had no idea this was coming, but actually they did because they were warned. Now, Jesus herein is giving a warning to his disciples, and it's more than just a warning about the series of events and end times. It's a warning about life. He begins Matthew chapter 25 using a reference to the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is just a reference that Jesus uses to, uh, it's an economical word, it's, an, it's understood in the economy sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? When we talk about an economy, we're talking about uh, if a bubble, or we're talking about, you know, things that are limited to this. The economy of heaven is different than the economy of earth. Right? The economy we're living in, we're living in an American economy, we're living, uh, our economy is different than, say, the economy in North Korea. Their economy would be different than ours. So the economy could be national. But the word economy that I'm using would be simply to understand this kingdom. So Jesus is not talking about an earthly kingdom. And he's not talking about a kingdom that will exist someday. He is specifically here not talking about the nation of Israel. Uh, oftentimes he talks about the future kingdom of Israel. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that when Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and then he spent forty days talking to them particularly about the kingdom of Israel. And after he talked about the kingdom of God and to the kingdom of Israel, they asked him the question before he went to heaven. They said, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus' response was, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in his power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. And so Jesus made them to understand. By the way, I'm going somewhere with this, so try to stay engaged. Jesus mentioned, he said to them, he said, uh, it's not for you to know the future events, the things that are you're not going to be here for or that aren't right now. He said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So in other words, he said, you know what? We're not talking about the kingdom of Israel right now. We're talking about the church. And that's the economy that you live in. It's good for us as believers to realize the day and age in which we live. There are Christians who are so fascinated with God's future plan for Israel. And God has a future plan for Israel. You read Romans chapter 9 all the way to the end of Romans, and you'll see that all Israel is going to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You read Revelation, and you'll see that there are 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe that make up the nation of Israel, and that, that we will be following Jesus who comes as their king, and we're going to rule and reign with Christ as part of an Israel kingdom. That's a future event, a future kingdom, that will actually be on this earth. That's a, that is a real thing. But Matthew chapter 25, when the Scripture says the kingdom of heaven, isn't talking about the church, and it isn't talking about Israel. It's talking about what we call heaven. It isn't wrong to say so, but oftentimes we misuse the term heaven. In other words, the word heaven, heaven means what? Space, sky, up. The space, the, that which is above us. When we ask the question, where is God? We oftentimes say heaven. But... 
We've had individuals go into heaven, right? That is, they went into outer space. Remember Sputnik? I don't see God. Mary went out into outer space and he said, I'm in heaven and God isn't here. Well, God is in the heavens. But there he is a real place where God physically is. There's a real throne room where God dwells and in that place there's an altar where the blood of Jesus Christ was offered as a sacrifice and that particular sacrifice made it possible so that individuals who were sinful could be covered by the blood of Jesus and could actually go and be with God. Where are the saints who believed in Jesus, who believed God's promise of a Messiah, and who trusted Jesus as their Savior? The answer is they're with God. Jesus told His disciples, He said, I, I go to prepare a place for you in John chapter 14. He just told them He was going to die. And He's preparing a place. That place, that word place, is a word that means an apartment. Now, if you study end times, and that's not what the study's about this morning, you'll see that there's going to come a time when God destroys this earth, consumes it by fire, and there won't be anything left. The elements are going to melt. Elements are basic enough that they cannot be broken down any further, and God's going to burn the elements of the earth up. It's going to be entirely destroyed. A very scientific uh, description of God's future destruction of this earth. And then God is going to make a new earth, and it will be inhabited only by those individuals who have believed in Jesus. And there will be no more opportunity at that time for sin. It will be, be a perfect world. And it will be a perfect kingdom. And heaven's going to come, the new Jerusalem. It's going to come down over that new earth. And we'll have our apartments, our mansions in heaven. But we'll be able to come and live on a new earth. And we'll be able to make places on the new earth and, and inhabit it and live in it forever. Forever. And we'll be able to, able to go into into the new Jerusalem where God dwells and have full access to God at all times and worship Him. And I intend to spend most of my time there, by the way. Well, that will be the place to be in God's presence. But the reality of it is, is that when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we don't think about things in terms of what Jesus is saying. But that's what we're talking about when we talk about the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> we're talking about the economy, the place, the kingdom where God is, now dwells. There are people who have gone before us who sleep in Jesus Christ who are already there. Now, in verse 25, we see a likeness and we see an illustration. Now, there are individuals that want to argue about whether this are pre-trib rapture or whether this, are, uh, these, this is a rapture that we're talking about. And that isn't actually the point of, of the, the text in chapter 25. The point in chapter 25, I'll tell you before we analyze it, is simply that the life we live now must be lived in preparation. The life that we live now must be lived in preparation for the sudden coming of the Son of Man that is being ready. And there are two ways that we can be prepared. First of all, the first way we can be prepared for Jesus, my friend, or actually for meeting Jesus, is by knowing Him as your Savior. There are individuals who have substituted in their minds religion or good works or uh, different notions or ideas for the reality that Jesus died for sin and that every person must deal with the reality that they need a Savior, that they're a sinner, that they need a Savior. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so every person, there are no good people, there are no people deserving of heaven and God's presence. Those, every individual who's ever been born deserves judgment. That's what we deserve. And, you know, our scripture here, Jesus saith unto him, this is in the context of, of the mansions, that Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so the reality, first of all, the first area of preparation in the life of any person is knowing Jesus as your Savior. If you have intentions or notions that it's going to be a combination of things that makes you acceptable when, when, uh, when, to, to get into God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, uh, when the bridegroom comes, that's Jesus. Uh, if you have the notion that you're going to be acceptable by your works or your religion or something you've been done, my friend, Jesus said, it's only by me. Only by me. You have to receive Jesus 
as your savior to be part of the economy. And the second area, of course, that is an area of application, is that we must live in readiness for the coming of Jesus. There is a stark contrast or difference between the way that Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives lived versus everyone else. The flood did not surprise Noah, but it surprised everybody else. Now, why didn't the flood sur surprise Noah? Because he was preparing for it. He was living for it. There's a, just, it it's common sense, but sometimes common sense isn't so common, it seems. It's common sense. Hey, build an ark. God says, build an ark. Noah said, okay. And uh, it's common sense that he was making preparations for it and he would have been prepared. Do you think the flood might have been a little bit of a surreal moment for Noah? Mm. Yeah. He knew it was coming, didn't he? But do you think it might have been a little bit surreal for him? Oh, yeah. Animals start coming onto the ark? Yeah. I get, I, you know, Tony did a video on that the other day. Uh, it's a plug for Tony. Uh, he, he did where you read, the, where the Bible audio text is read. And then he just compiled different videos and tried to do a presentation of what it was like when the animals went onto the ark, the accurate version. Nobody really knows what exactly that was like, uh, but uh, individuals have spent a lot of time analyzing what the scripture says, along with uh, just, just uh, some speculation, have figured out a lot of things about Noah and the ark. I think about the time the animals started coming on the ark, it got real for Noah. Don't you? Yeah. I think about the time the animals started coming on the ark. And I don't know if birds, in dinos if dinosaurs maybe laid eggs, or if Noah went out egg collecting. Probably the dinosaurs came and gave them to him, I suppose. Like, here, take care of this. You'll need it for later. <laughs> you know, or something like that. I'm not sure exactly how it went. But it, was, it would have been a very surreal experience. And you know, anyone who had been watching to see if it was true what Noah had said probably could have observed some things that were going on before the door on the ark was shut, don't you think? But they didn't. I think still it must have been surreal for Noah when for the first time ever rains came, floods came, and uh, the, the ark began for the first time to float. It must have been surreal. But it wasn't surreal because Noah didn't believe it. It was surreal because he never experienced it before. You ever always wanted to do something, and when you actually get to do it, you're just like, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. I always wanted to fly a small plane. Not by myself. I've never flown a small plane by myself. I will someday, but I haven't done that. But I always want to fly a small plane. And I remember the first time I got to go flying in a small plane, it was kind of surreal. Especially when the pilot said, here, you know, <laughs> and let me fly and went to sleep. <laughs> you know, uh, it was kind of surreal. You know, it's like, wow, am I really flying a plane? And right? he kind of showed me a couple things and he went to sleep. He said, okay, we're in the air, you know, and he went to sleep. And I remember just sitting there just thinking, am I really flying a plane? Wow, is this really real? I always want to fly a plane. It's not impossible to fly a plane, but you know, when you always want to do something, you look forward to doing it and you actually get to do it. It's like, kind of like, wow, is this real? There are a few things, a few times in life I've wanted to do things or have experiences and I, or maybe visit a place and I'm like, am I really, really here in this place? You know, am I really on the top of this mountain? I mean, is this a real place? Am I, you know, there's places all my life. I didn't get to visit Yosemite until I was an adult. I always wanted to visit Yosemite. And the day I was in Yosemite a couple years ago, one of the days I was there, I was just like, man, is this really real? Am I really in Yosemite? You know, uh, last, last, was it last year that we went to Yellowstone? Two years ago, I think. I don't know if I went, I don't think it was last year. My wife and I drove out to Yellowstone and drove through all the geothermal springs and all. I'd never been there. It's pretty cool. You know, you think there's Old Faithful, but there's actually 30 miles of just well, water blasting out of the ground. You know, you just think, I think I want to leave. <laughs> you never know when something's going to pop out of the ground and boil someone to death. You know? But it's kind of, you're there, and you're like, wow, you know, I, I remember being a kid, reading in, in my history book, reading in books about Old Faithful and seeing pictures of the lodge at Old Faithful, and then being there, and like, wow, this is really, you know, this is, you know, you kind of have a surreal experience. That's the way the kingdom of heaven will be for people who are ready for it. But they won't be like, I didn't know this was going to happen, or I never planned this, or I never thought. It's like, I always thought, but there will be a surreal feeling. There's a big difference between that and someone who says, I didn't believe it would ever happen. Never thought it was real. Never thought they'd do that. Now let's look at the illustration. The Bible says there were five foolish and five wise. Verse 2. Okay, we see the description of the foolish, first of all, verse 3. In case you're wondering if I'm almost done, I am. The Bible says, 
They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, obviously, this is not a subtle reference to preparation, is it? It's not a subtle reference to preparation. Anthony and I and Mrs. Price went camping on an island during spring break for one night. We went on a Tuesday night, I believe it was, and came back on Wednesday. But we went camping overnight on an island. And we made some preparations. Uh, one of the things that you always find that you want on an island, especially when it's surrounded by salt water, is water, fresh water. And the waves were so bad when we took my brother's dinghy and we had the boat so overloaded that the water disappeared. A 24-pack of water, or maybe it was a 36, whatever, big thing of water, disappeared while we were on the way there. And, you know, there, there was big waves. It was, it was kind of, the wind was blowing, there was bad weather. And Anthony's the guy that jumped in the water and brought the boat up, and I'm trying to keep the boat from swamping. And... Anthony, I'm throwing things at him from the boat. He's on the shore, and I'm throwing tents and cots and coolers and all that stuff. And I said, where's the water? Did I throw the water out? And Anthony's like, oh, you know, he gives us deer in the eyes look. Like, you know, we know we put the water in, but it wasn't there. It, it came out of the boat somewhere. Uh, at least we didn't come out of the boat. That's what we felt about it. But uh, it came out of the boat. It was lost. And, you know, when you find out you're on an island and you're going to stay overnight or you don't know how long you're going to stay, you realize, you know, I want to have water here. There's preparations that are important. And it's just amazing when you get out in the middle of somewhere and you realize, wow, forgot the, you know, I've got the lantern, but I don't have the fuel. That's a problem. Now, the bridegroom story, and I'll tell this just briefly, uh, this is... This is just Jesus speaking to something that all the people would have understood from their culture. It would have been customary when there would have been inheritance of the land. It would have been customary for the son to build an apartment on the side of his father's house after a betrothal had been made, an engagement where uh, two fathers, and of course you hope that the children were in on it too, but had agreed to marriage. Uh, you know, here's you've got a daughter, I've got a son. And we're going to agree to terms for marriage. How much are you going to pay me to marry your daughter? Whatever, however that goes. I think it was a little bit in the reverse. And when they had made terms, they'd come to a legal agreement. They were officially married. But they hadn't come together yet. And so uh, the woman would have been just like the description of Mary. She would have been a virgin. She would have been waiting at her father's house. And after the contract had been made, the, the bridegroom would go home and he would build an apartment, a mansion on his father's house. That's the picture of what Jesus is doing for us in heaven. When he says, I go there to prepare a place for you, he's preparing a mansion in his father's house. That's the illustration of that. And we're the church, we're the bride that he's going to present to himself without spot and without wrinkle. So that's the picture when you read Ephesians 5 and John chapter 14 and here in Matthew chapter 25. That would have been the cultural custom that they would have understood in Israel because the land was so important it was important for a wife to come and live in the son's apartment on the father's house awaiting the inheritance uh, so it became a fun thing you know the brides the bride would send out spies try to find out how the apartment's coming along you know maybe somebody comes by you know and, and uh, hey you know I heard uh, I heard you were working at uh, Charlie's place the other day. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, how, how's it coming along? And, oh, we got a Charlie here, don't we? Uh, 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 heard you're working at Charlie's place. How's, how's it looking over there? And he'd say, well, give me five bucks and I'll tell you. You know, uh -huh. and, uh, you know or maybe, tell, oh, it's done. It's finished. The place is finished. You know, <gasps> it's finished already? Is it really finished? Are you, you're lying to me. Is it really ready? And the bride would try to find out what was going on, but actually the bridegroom, the, the apartment was finished when he felt like he was ready to go for his bride. Mm. Now there'd be some guys probably get the thing done in a day. Well, we got, you know, we got rafters up. That's good. I'm going to get her. You know, he wants, there'd be some other guys to be like, his dad, like, you done with that house yet? No, not yet, dad. Next day, you done with that house yet? It's going to be a while, I think. You know, depending on who you're marrying, I think. Yeah, so, okay, maybe that wasn't funny. <laughs> okay, but, you know, that would be the, the custom. And the whole time, the bride is, she's already contracted for. They're already married. And as soon as that bridegroom comes from her, then she's got to be ready to go. And so, he'd come in the middle of the night. He'd try to catch her by surprise. And bring the wedding party. As soon as he comes, they're going to have a party. 
everybody's going to go in and they're going to go into the bride's house or the bridegroom's house and it's going to be a big celebration. And she's supposed to be ready the whole time that they're contracted for. So it's not like this is my wedding day. Well, it might be. <laughs> or it might be tomorrow. <laughs> but, so oftentimes, uh, it could be in the middle of the night. Well, if he might come tonight, do you want to go in the dark or you want to have your lamp ready? Whereas when you put your lamp out, you check and make sure it's full of oil. And you make sure you got oil with you because he might come. And if he comes for you, you're not going to be able to make it to the celebration. You've got to have your lamp ready. That's the picture here. You see the illustration? And so here are some bridesmaids or some uh, virgins. The Bible calls them foolish virgins. They're contracted for. They're supposed to be married to the bride, but they don't bother making sure that they're ready. And all of a sudden, there's a noise. And it's like, there's a parade. It's the middle of the night. And you hear, you know, everybody shouting and yelling, Hey! Charlie's wife! We're coming! Or whatever it is, whatever her name is. Whoever Charlie is. And uh, they're on the way. And you can hear the noise in the streets, and they wake up and they're like, oh, He's coming! He's coming! And the bride hurries up, and she's like, I'm out of here. We're going. We're going. We're getting married. You know, hey, ladies, this would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, some of y'all be like, that would not be the perfect wedding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it, hey, it, it, at least it'd be a great party, right? At least for everybody but the bride. <laughs> you gotta hope. Well, anyway, so anyway, the um, bridegroom comes. The Bible says in verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Is that okay? <laughs> well, I think so. The Bible says at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Ah! <laughs> yeah. Where? You know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> like, at midnight, right? Middle of the night. Bridegroom's coming. And the Bible says all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Okay, get, light them up. And the foolish said unto the wise, Keep us up your oil. Uh, we, we have, our, our lamps are gone out. We're out of oil. But the Bible says the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. It doesn't do any good to give somebody your oil if you don't have any. You can't make this kind of preparation for someone else. See, I remember the first time I heard this, I remember my dad reading this story. When I was a kid, I thought, boy, they were selfish. No, I'm going to give you my oil. Go get your own. I thought, I'm not allowed to do that in our house. Somebody asked for something in our house, you better share, or you're going to be in trouble. But that isn't the deal here. The deal is there isn't enough. So it's give me your preparation and turn for my own. And I want to remind you exactly what Jesus is saying here, my friend, and that is that no one else can prepare for heaven for you. No one else can prepare for heaven for you. It's your responsibility. You're not going to be able to say, hey, somebody cover me. And the second area of application here is that no one else can live for Jesus for you either. No one can prepare for heaven in your place and no one else can live for Jesus in their place. Their oil is for them and your oil is for you. The illustration here of oil, of course, in all instances in the Scripture, the Holy Spirit is used as an illustration for oil. And God's Spirit is for you. You must have God's Spirit in you, my friend. The way to do that is to be sealed by God's Spirit, and that's, that happens upon receiving Jesus as your Savior. And then, my friend, you live for Jesus. And here Jesus is reminding these, His disciples as He's closing up His last words with His disciples. He's reminding them that you've got to prepare. You've got to live your life. No one else can prepare and no one else can live your life. You'll not be able to say, well, no, I'm not a Christian, but my mother is. Or no, I'm not a Christian, but I had a godly grandmother. And I feel like she's prayed for me enough that God's going to let me into heaven. No, it's your oil. And it's your lamp. And you are responsible for yourself. And so the Bible says in verse 9, the wise answer said, not so lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather than that sell, buy for yourself, go get your own. Get your own. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They said, the bridegroom cometh! That was the shout. What did the bridegroom come when they shouted? Came shortly after. Came shortly after. See, the bridegroom cometh, and they said, oh, we better get oil. That's not when you get oil. It's not when you get oil. 
you get oil in the daytime, and you get oil before the announcement. My friend, there are so many individuals who have played with their eternal destiny. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, and He's declared it. See, we have the shout right here. Jesus is coming. This is the shout. The bridegroom cometh. Listen, we're betrothed. And Jesus is coming. And, and Jesus went on to say, in verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. You're not my bride. I don't recognize you. Watch therefore. Now Jesus has gone from, stopped from telling the story, and now he has given the application. He said, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now here's a question. Is Jesus coming? Yes. Yes. Do you know that? Yes. Will it seem surreal when Jesus comes? I mean, I've been living I've been living my whole life in anticipation of Jesus coming. I'm telling you, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be ready, I'm gonna be surprised. I'm just gonna be like, wow, is this real? It's gonna be it's gonna be literally a surreal. We'll never have had an experience like it. Just like in the days of Noah, they'd never seen a flood before, but they knew it was coming. My friend, I've never seen Jesus come, but He's coming. And the notion that, well, I've never seen Him before, so if it happens, then I'll do something. Jesus says, if it happens and you haven't done something, it'll be too late. It'll be too late. And my friend, that's the application. It's pretty simple this morning, isn't it? Don't wait till it's too late. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? You know, I think because of pride sometimes... There are individuals who have not even personalized the gospel. In other words, they say, well, I agree with the gospel. I hope I'm saved. I hope God accepts the way I've approached Him or the way I've prepared uh, to, to receive Him. You know, I haven't done it exactly. You know, I, ha I don't know if I've ever just called out and said, Jesus saved me, but I got baptized when I was a kid and I went to church and I did this and this and this. And my friend, I'm going to just tell you something. You're like a person who God has contracted for. He's betrothed to but you don't have oil for your lamp. you got your lamp, but you don't have any oil for it. And the announcement's been made, and you think that somehow when the Lord comes, you'll be able to work it all out then. My friend, you won't work it out then, you work it out now. You've got to receive Jesus as your Savior. Listen, you and I don't tell God how it's going to be. God gave us the best way it could be. Jesus. You receive God's plan. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you know, when, when, when should you? When ought you? And the answer is today. Today's the day of your salvation. Don't be like the foolish virgin who had a lamp but no oil. Don't wait till it's too late. And the second area of application is really practical as well. My friend, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. You know, you could be a believer and be asleep and realize, well, I knew He was coming, but I didn't know it would be this soon. You know, when Jesus comes, there are going to be people who have said, I didn't know it would be this soon. There are individuals that have said, I thought it would be by now. No, they're okay. They're covered. But the individuals that would say, I didn't know He was coming this soon. My friend, they're not going to be ready. They're not going to be ready. You know, it would be a real tragedy for you to have received Jesus as your Savior but then never live your life like He's actually coming. It's another illustration that Jesus uses here. My friend, it'll be too late to do anything for Jesus at that time. So live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this morning about being prepared and about living for Jesus. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to understand that though we've never experienced the Kingdom of Heaven as it's described in the Scripture, that it's a reality. This is not fanciful. This isn't a possibility. But Jesus, the Son of Man, is coming. And we must be prepared for Him. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I would like to have a personal time of invitation. I would like to give everyone the opportunity this morning to make sure that you know that you have eternal life and that you're not only going to have a lamp, but you're going to have oil with it. If you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed out of respect for everyone else here, and uh, be, just be careful not to be a distraction or look on anyone else's privacy during the invitation. So I'd like to ask a practical question. 
And it's a simple one. It's this. Do you know that you've received Jesus as your Savior? And are you confident that you have eternal life because you've trusted Him for your Savior? Are you saved? Have you received Christ as your Savior? It's a simple question. If you don't understand the question, the answer to it's probably no. But if you do understand the question, you're here this morning, you'd say, I received Jesus as my Savior. You just slip your hand and say, Pastor, I know, I know that I know that I'm ready. When Jesus comes, I know that I've received Him, and I'll be ready. I've, I've got my oil. I've got my lamp. Okay? Let me ask the second part of the question. You're here this morning, and you'd say, well, Pastor, you know something, as I look at the text of the Scripture, I'm like many other individuals who have read it. I'm concerned. I'm concerned that I'm not going to be ready when Jesus comes. Pastor, pray for me. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But uh, I'm concerned that, that if Jesus comes, I might be one of the foolish ones who doesn't have oil for their lamp. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up real quick. Let's slip it up. Slip it right back down. Okay? All right? Here's what we'll do then. If that's you, you're concerned. You're concerned that when Jesus comes, you may not be ready. If your concern is because you know that you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, you could do that right now. You could, you could just do business with God right now. Uh, I trusted Jesus as my Savior years ago, and here's, here's how simple it was. I accepted the free gift of eternal life. You see, I've sinned and you've sinned, and the Bible says that the consequences or wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And years ago, I called on the name of Jesus. And these aren't the exact words that I used, but here's what I told Jesus in my heart. I said, God... I want the free gift of eternal life. I want to be saved. I want to be your child. Will you save me? And you could say it as simply as Jesus saved me, understanding that it's because of the cross that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that receiving the free gift is a choice that you make and that you want to be born again. And simply by asking Jesus to save you, uh, God will right now. Why don't you just pray and tell God that. Tell Him from your heart, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to receive the free gift of eternal life. And if you prayed that, uh, you're saved. You're just as saved as you possibly could be simply for asking. God doesn't save someone for works that they do. He saves them for the work of the cross that Jesus Christ did and because you received the free gift. Get, getting born again is, is accepting the free gift. And you'll be prepared when Jesus comes. The second area would be the second part of our invitation this morning. And that would be that if you've never trusted Jesus, or if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you feel like, you know, in some ways... I'm like a foolish virgin. I'm living like the bridegroom isn't going to come. And when he comes, I'm not prepared the way that I ought to be. And if that's you here today, let's just have a minute uh, without playing a song, without uh, anything else. Let's just have a minute for you to just do business with God about it. Maybe it's because of sin that's in your life, or maybe it's because of an area where you're supposed to be serving God, and you know it, God's shown you, but you're not doing it. Why don't you do business with God right now?